Thank you. Hey, we're going to begin with, with prayer. And as we do that, we're going to pray that God will open our hearts to his word today, encourage us. But I also want to remember, um, we have students coming home from camp. I had the opportunity to be up there with them this week, came back to be here with you today. But we have 18, I think it's 18 middle schoolers and 31 high school students up at Palomar, and they're coming down. So a uh, great time. I've heard great reports, but, uh, and I had a great time up there. But let's pray for them for safety, remembering God is sovereign and he is in control. So join me in prayer. God, thank you so much for your word. Um, today, there's some incredible encouragement in the midst of some, some warning, some incredible encouragement for us uh, this morning. And we are reminded that you are sovereign. You are in control. You control our destiny. You control tomorrow. And, and so we want to lean into that. And, and as we do that, we want to recognize you right now in your sovereignty that you would ask, um, actually ask, uh, work on our asks, our requests for these Students that are coming home from camp today, God, would you protect them? Um, we have heard about good growth that's happened spiritually. We thank you for that. And now as they return, may they have a safe trip down the mountain. And Lord, would you uh, cause what they learned about you today to, to just really uh, be seated in their hearts, that they would not let go of that um, as they come home. We thank you for your kindness to us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, it's no news for you today for me to talk about the pandemic of anxiety in our culture, is it? I mean, we know that. We've talked about that here at the fields. Um, it's around the world, in, in many countries, anxiety, worry, fear, um, at pandemic levels. And the Bible talks about anxiety and fear and worry. Um, there is a lot that God comes to us with to encourage our hearts because we all experience it. God likens us, his people, as sheep. And if you know anything about sheep, they're skittish creatures. Uh, they can look pretty peaceful out in an open pasture, uh, but the littlest thing can set them off. Um, when my wife and I were living in New Zealand, and then later subsequent trips, sometimes with our kids, um, we've had some fun with, with sheep out there. Um, I don't know if you know much about New Zealand, but uh, right now, currently, uh, the ratio of people to sheep, it's five, uh, one to five. Uh, for every one person, there's five sheep. It used to be one to 10. A lot of sheep, a lot of green hills, a lot of white dots on them. And so something I, I learned to do, a game I kind of play, and some of you might think this is a little cruel. It's not cruel, okay? It's fun. Um, but when you're driving along down open road and you come across uh, a paddock with a bunch of sheep in them, uh, if you honk the horn, they stampede. It's awesome. I do it all the time, you know? It's not hurting them. So I'm like, hey, kids, watch this. And they run. And it's super fun to see that. I mean, I, I don't know. My personality, ask my wife. I'm always poking, looking for a reaction, okay? Well, sheep, they get a great reaction. You do that with cows, and I've done it, nothing. You know, they're like, what's up, dude? You know, if you're lucky if they look up. But sheep, they go nuts. It's, it's fun. Uh, they're skittish about everything. Well, sometimes, like sheep living in this world of uncertainty, God refers to himself as the good shepherd because he made us, he knows how we're wired, and he knows as a good shepherd what we need. And in scripture, he has some great things to say to us to calm us down. He's not like me. He's not leaning on the horn for us. He's calming us down. Think about Psalm 23. Some of you may have heard of that psalm. Some of you that are familiar with Christianity, you've walked in that. But for some of you, it's like, I've never heard this. Listen to the comforting words of the good shepherd to sheep, his people. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Evil, Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. People have heard these words for centuries, these comforting words. In fact, not too long ago, I actually re-memorized this. I, I knew the vague outline, but I re-memorized it. Now, I didn't do it 
by memory in front of you because I don't want to embarrass myself because I'd probably miss a word and go, ah, he messed that up, right? But I needed to relearn that. I needed to hear it again. I needed the reminder to change my focus. Words like these are just the tip of the iceberg of things that God has to share with us to comfort us, to encourage us, to chill us out. We are so many times anxious people when we live in anxious times. But I think anxiety may be at pandemic levels because of the flow of information, the, 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 the amount of info that we are getting these days. We have more information coming to us in our day and age than all the previous generations of human history. Now, as a Christian, I think it's good for us to be in, informed. I think we should know about what's going on in our world to a degree. And for me, I know that I can sometimes be an information junkie. I can, I can you know, I, I don't go into the, the gossip you know, world so much, but I, information, and I like learning how to do things. Like, I love YouTube, you know, I love, you can log into YouTube and find out how to fix your car, how to prune your fruit trees, how to do almost anything. That can be good, but we have this overwhelming flow of information coming at us, and think about our teens. They're getting so much that anxiety is, is just going off the charts for them and for us. Too much information can be a bad thing. And when I spend way more time consuming information than focusing on the one who's really in control, that becomes a problem. Now, when you think about it, anxiety and worry, what does that trace back to? Well, it's a desire to control, it's a desire to be God, it's a desire of all kinds of things, but a lot of it can go back to our fear about what tomorrow holds, doesn't it? Think about it. Now, you, you can have anxiety about things you've done in the past, but most of our anxieties are fueled by the unknown of tomorrow. And our passage talks about that and talks about we don't know what tomorrow is and we need to remember who does and lean into who does. Take a look at this passage with me again. Come now, you who say tomorrow or today we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Here's the deal. When we are consumed by tomorrow, we actually do what is called borrowing trouble, don't we? I borrow trouble all the time. I think about the what if of tomorrow. Now, what this passage is helping to correct is this idea of many times we, we live our lives as Christians, but we are practical atheists in reality. What does it mean to be a practical atheist? Well, we may say we believe in God. We may know that God is sovereign and is in control, but we live as if God doesn't exist. We live if, as if we are the masters of our fate, of our destiny. We live as if, all of life depends on us, or we plan as if there is no God, or that God is not sovereign over every aspect of life. And when we do that, we end up carrying a load that God never intended for us to carry ourselves. And it's no wonder that anxiety is at pandemic proportions these days. What I want us to do today is we're going to look at these verses in James and remind ourselves that we do so much better when we live our lives according to Coram Deo. Now, some of you know that's a Latin term. What does that mean? Well, Coram Deo literally means before the face of God. And the phrase is commonly used to mean Christians living in the presence of, under the authority of, and to the honor and glory of God. Here in these verses, God is telling us, remember me. Remember God. Remember I'm in control. Remember I'm sovereign. Remember who is in charge. Remember to incorporate that familiar but often neglected phrase, Lord willing. Look back at verse 13. We read this. Again, now, come now, you who say, tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know 
what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, I want to do a little bit of correction. This set of verses is not about the person that outwardly lives with anxiety about tomorrow. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's about the person who looks like they're very confident on the outside and they have no concern about tomorrow because they're going to make a big difference tomorrow. They're going to make a lot of profit tomorrow. They think that they are in control. I've got the world by the tail and I know what I'm going to do. But here's the deal. Whether you're the one that, that feels really afraid about tomorrow, or you're the one that goes, oh, I'm going to kill it tomorrow. Both people are really in the same place. Think about those people, those wealthy billionaires, okay, that think they have the world at their feet and they're bidding. Many of those people struggle with the same anxieties that we do. You just don't see it. But you see a lot of them strung out on cocaine or later committing suicide because they actually deep down inside know that they aren't controlled. So, so both people are in the same place. And anxiety is something that everyone struggles with. Remember who James is writing to and who he is. James is the half-brother of Jesus, okay? And, and because of that, he's Jewish. And James is writing to a Jewish audience, a, a group of Jewish people that are followers of Jesus. They're scattered around the Roman Empire. And, and what do we know historically about the Jews of that time? Well, they were historically known as good business people. Um, they were killing it with their work ethic and their money-making ability. And they would travel all around the Roman Empire on the Roman roads and in the Roman shipping lanes, enjoying the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, to make money. And there's nothing wrong with making money. In fact, Scripture says it is God that gives us the ability to make money. But what God is warning those people is be careful that you think that you are the one that is in control. It, to do this business, they would have to plan trips and, and make engagements and, and, and secure products and goods and services and move them around. But the Bible is saying, be careful relying on your own skill, your own ability, your idea that you are in control of this thing. Now, God is not against planning. He's not against making money. He's not against business. Those are good things, okay? And we have to be careful. This is a great set of verses to remind us of the importance of taking things in context. You know, it's been said that you can make the Bible say anything that you want it to say. In fact, for instance, in the Bible, these words are literally there. There is no God. Do you know it says that in the Bible? It does. The Bible says that there is no God. But the context is, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. These verses are not against planning. A wise person plans. That's not the issue here. In fact, check out what Jesus says. He's teaching, and he's telling people about following him. And, and we know that the scriptures teach that salvation is free. But there is a cost in following Jesus. And so as he's teaching about following him, he's, he's warning the people, if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you, and you need to calculate that cost, and you need to plan ahead to see if you really want to follow me. And he says this in Luke chapter 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, here's the warning. Here's, here's the plan ahead. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying... This man began to build and was not able to finish. No, no, plan ahead. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Here's the deal. Planning is not the issue. 
Don't try to make the Bible say something it doesn't say. We just have to remember that important phrase, Lord willing. Planning is not against God. You know, when I was a young engineer, uh, I had the opportunity to, to work in aerospace where we were building airliners. And one of the phrases that one of the older engineers would say continuously to us whenever we encounter a problem is, there's an easier way to make a living than building airplanes, okay? Now, if you've never worked on anything like that, you have no idea what I'm saying, but, but let me just talk about this. If you've ever had the opportunity to look at pictures or be in an aircraft before they put the beauty panels on, there is an incredibly complex system of wiring and tubing and fasteners. I mean, it's, it's crazy how difficult and complex these aircraft are. Give me an example. A Boeing 747 has six million individual parts. Three million of those are just fasteners alone. And, and wiring. A 747 has 171 miles of wiring and five miles of tubing that's custom bent to fit in these areas so they can have hydraulic control. And in building the 747 originally, there were over 75,000 engineering drawings. Can you imagine that? That's more pages in your Bible. 75, and those were hand done. It was before computer-aided drafting. They were done by hand. There is an easier way to make a living than building airplanes. All right, amen? But I'm glad that people planned ahead. I'm glad they were engineers. I'm, and this isn't even talking about the, the, the uh, supplier management side of it and, and, and the control of building the little parts that go into the bigger hole. But I'm glad somebody did that because I love to travel. I love to explore. Now, I could do it on a boat, and boats take plans too. But aircraft get you there quicker, so I'm glad they did it. There's nothing wrong with that. But it takes in a massive amount of planning. And planning is necessary and a good thing. Uh, think about this. Have you ever built a house? I, I look out there, I see some architects, some builders. Ever built a house or, or built out a building or built a building? Okay, what do you have to do? To, well, you gotta have a set of plans and where do you take those plans? Down to the planning department or the building commission, okay? And so you take them down there for approval. Planning is necessary. We would not have gone into this building without some planning. We, we, we retrofitted the whole building. And going to the building department is necessary. Now, just a little side thing, okay? This had nothing to do with anything. And if you work for the building department, maybe this will encourage you, okay? How many of you dread going to the planning department or building? Yes, we do. Why? It's a pain, you know? Here's the deal. If I were God, if I were mayor, if I was president... I would remind those people behind the counter, you work for the taxpayer, okay? They are your customer. When they come in, you should have the attitude of, you know, when to go to those nice hotels and the people that work there, they're like all about doing things for you. When the customer comes in, you say, how can I help you? How can I help you get this building built? How can I serve you better? How can I remove roadblocks from you? Is it that way? No. You feel like they're going, how can I stop you? You know, it's, 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 it's so backwards. Anyways, that's the planning department. If you work there, praise God, just remember, we are the taxpayers, okay? All right. <laughs> Having said that, I am so glad that the building department, the planning department exists. I've been to countries, maybe you have too, where when an earthquake happens, some of these massive buildings fall down and kill lots of people. Why? No planning. Bad set of plans. Corruption in the planning department. Bad inspectors, they didn't. Corruption, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Planning is not the issue. The issue is the heart that lives as if there is no God and that we are in control. I set my own destiny. I can do whatever I want. And this passage says there is an incredible amount of arrogance and boasting, which is evil when we live that way. So we have the reminder here in our passage today about our lives. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. You say that, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. The issue is 
not about planning. Yes, go ahead and plan, but remember God in your plan because you don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't and can't control tomorrow. Only God can. And God gives us this really cool word picture to remind us of it. He says that our lives are like a water vapor. A water vapor, just something temporary. I live over in Carlsbad here by Calavera Lake. Sometimes early in the morning when I'm coming to work or, or going to a meeting, I'll drive by the lake and I'll look over and there's this really cool fog or mist over the lake. And it's really cool and picturesque to look at. You've, you've seen it or you've been out camping and seen something like that. But as soon as that sun comes up, as soon as it comes out from behind the clouds and the, and the sun rays hit that water vapor, what happens? It's gone, poof. It's only there an hour or less. It doesn't stay. In your planning, remember, this life is temporary. And it goes by so quick. It doesn't matter whether God gives you 20 years or 90 years. In light of eternity, this life, is so short, here this morning and gone this afternoon. God reminds us of that in Isaiah 40. He reminds us of it all over the scripture, but Isaiah 40 verse seven says this, the grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now maybe an appropriate Southern California translation of this verse would be, the tan fades and the muscle withers. Amen? Yes, some of us more than others. But the reminder of the temporalness and that God is the one that is in control. This life that we have been given is an incredible gift. It matters. Now, you look at a vapor and go, oh, that doesn't matter. No, this life does matter. But it doesn't last on earth forever. God and his word last forever. So how we live in this life matters because this life will determine where we spend eternity. So it's brief, but it matters for all of eternity. You know, I had the joy of going up with our, our high school students up to Palomar Mountain. Um, I drove them up there, and then I was there for a couple days, spoke at a couple of our sessions. Um, got a picture. Look at this, 31 high school students, and that's just half of our group. Uh, incredible turnout. You, some of those kids don't know Jesus. It's so awesome uh, to be up there with them. Um, I love working with your kids. I was just encouraged left and right being up there with these students, you know, and seeing some of them take step in faith. Um, I've already heard that at least one of those those students uh, gave their life to Christ this weekend, uh, and there might be some more. We're going to have some baptisms. Super, super fun to be up there with them. What a great group. Again, uh, in the last year and a half that I've been leading that, I'm um, seeing it grow, and, and now we're transferring the leadership over to one of our own. It's just really, really cool to see the momentum that is going on in that ministry. When we got there Wednesday night, had dinner, sunset, we went around this campfire, and the campfire ring was lit, and we unplugged the lights, and so we just had this glowing little fire there. And I had the students look up. It was planned. I planned the talk. Amen? Okay? So they're looking up. I say, see that star? What do you think is beyond that star? How far do you think that star is away? Well, that star might be 100 million light years away. That star may have already burnt out, and we're just seeing the light from it now. We don't, we don't even know. But what's beyond that star? And then what's beyond that star? Now, we know the universe is not infinite, but it is massive. And then I asked the students to think about, now think about the God that made that. He was around from before the universe began, because he made it. And he'll be around when it's all over. He's infinite. We have a hard time thinking beyond, beyond, beyond the star. I mean, it just blows you away. But then you think of it, our finite minds can't comprehend eternity. God, God controls eternity. God offers us eternal life. We were going through John chapter three and we hear it over and over again. Jesus is saying eternal life. What is that? That is with God forever or apart from God forever. 
Gosh, just being with these students, uh, it reminded me of why I became a pastor. Sometimes with the heaviness of ministry, I forget, you know, trying to organize and run things here and stuff. And just being up there and pointing them, Jesus, so refreshing. This is why I'm in the ministry. But, but the perspective that we were trying to provide for these students, yes, go ahead and plan. But remember God when you plan. He is the one who really is in control, and we need to live in light of that. So verse 15, instead of living as practical atheists, no, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. What an incredible cure for anxiety right here in this passage. Remembering who's in control. Who's in control if I live? Who's in control about tomorrow? Coming to God and honoring him. You know, one of the things that um, we do as Christians, this is modeled after Jesus, when we sit down to eat a meal, uh, some people look at us as if we're superstitious when we pray before the meal. Or when we pray before we we take a trip. We we prayed with these students before we went up the mountain. We prayed for them as they come down. That's not superstition. Jesus actually, God himself, prayed before a meal. He remembered God gave him this food that they're about to eat. Prayer before a meal is just a helpful reminder. Where did this come from? It came from God. He's sovereign. He's sovereign whether I take another breath. He's sovereign whether I take another bite. He's sovereign whether I live another day. It, it, the act of prayer reminds us of actually who is in control and how he has provided for us. And in prayer, we are saying no to our tendency to live as practical atheists. It's a great reminder. But when we fail to do that, we have a problem. And in verse 16, we see what the problem is. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. God calls it out here. Prideful arrogance is to live as if we are actually in control versus God being in control. And it's incredibly ridiculous when we live that way. You know, some of you are familiar with a tool that we use. We use it in our premarital counseling here at the fields called the Myers-Briggs uh, Temperament Sorter. Okay, it's like a personality, not test, but type. It, it's not God's word. It, I, I use a lot of tools in premarital. It's just one tool. Not developed by Christians, but, but there's helpful things out there. Um, your cancer drug might or might not have been developed by a Christian. Just use it though, right? Okay? So it's not God's word. But in that profile, there's a bunch of letters that kind of categorize and say you tend to operate this way, you tend to operate that way. It's helpful for married uh, people going in marriage kind of understand each other better that way. Are you an extrovert? Are you an introvert? That kind of thing. Well, the last letters in that profile is you either tend to be a J or a P. Okay, J people are characterized by people that are decisive, okay? Now, they may be bad decisions, they may be good decisions, but for them, they're just driven, let's just get the decision made and move on. That's it, okay? Now, J is not bad, but J can tend to be a little more controlling in some ways, okay? You put J on a vacation with an itinerary and something changes, they lose it, you know? They've got to know what's going to happen tomorrow. They can't handle not being in control. That is something to be repented of. But P, the P person, I'm a P, keep my options open, baby. Don't box me in. I want to be able to decide when I want to be able to decide. I want my, that can be sinful too because the P person can have a lack of trusting God too. They can't make a decision or they just want the open options open. And so again, that can show up as a lack of trust. See how, it doesn't matter how you're wired, trust is an issue that we all have to deal with. It all boils down to where are you putting your trust? I love the words of Psalm 20 because they're a good reminder to those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus. Psalm 20 verse seven says this. Some trust in horses, and some trust in chariots. But we, as God's people, we're going to trust in the name of the Lord God Almighty. Some trust in their bank account. Some trust in their good looks. Some trust in their career. Some trust in their ability as engineers to figure it out. Some trust in their hard work. Some trust in the government. Some trust in their company. No, no. 
Those who know God and love God, they trust in God. And that's the people of God. That's such a helpful reminder for us. You know, I, I was thinking about these verses in James and thinking about my own life and thinking about Psalm 20, verse 7, and, and just the reminders of Scripture. And I really need to be trusting God right now. But as I look back on my life, I've always needed to be trusting God. God, what university do you want me to go to? You want me to go to Berkeley or to Cal Poly? I got accepted to both. I made the right choice. Cal Poly, right? Sorry, Berkeley grads, all right? Um, God, who do you want me to marry? God, where do you want me to live? God, what do you want me to do with, with the life you've given me? Where do I spend it? I've always needed to be trusting God. I know what it's like to have a child that is facing a very real life-threatening issue. I, I know that. I also know what it's like to walk through with my wife three miscarriages. I also know what it's like to have very close family members on both sides die. I also know what it's like to wake up early in the morning stressed out over the ministry here at the fields and know I'm not trusting you now, right now, Jesus. My lack of sleep is betraying that. You love your church more than I do. I know what it's like to a little degree to walk side by side with Paul the Apostle who after going through all the things he's gone through, shipwreck and beatings and starvation, he says, but you know what the hardest thing is? The thing that burdens my soul the most is the constant daily care of the churches. He also faced that anxiety, that, 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 that burden that, that, that is familiar to many of us and he had to learn to trust Jesus. Some of you have gone through things I've never experienced. Some of you have battled cancer. I, I don't know what that's like. Some of you have battled financial ruin. Uh, things have been really tight for us um, along the way at times, but I've never almost lost it all, let alone losing it all. Some of you have experienced that. How do you trust Jesus in that? And some of you, well, no marriage is perfect. Mine's not perfect. God has protected us so far from the ravages of divorce, but some of you have walked through the pain of divorce, whether through your fault or their fault or no fault. You've experienced that pain and the brokenness in this world. Common for all of us, regardless of what we are experiencing or what we have experienced, common is our need to trust Jesus for our futures and not trust in ourselves, not trust in our chariots, not trust in our horses. And God gives us a warning here at the end to remind us, folks, if you know, if you know, then you need to walk in it. What do we know? We know God is good. Listen to this warning. Therefore, to the one who knows to do the right thing and does not do it, to him, it is sin. What's the right thing here? Remember your God. Remember to plan, Lord willing. Remember to keep pointing yourself back to God to trust him. To remember that while we don't know what the future holds, we know who holds the future. So how do we do this thing well? Well, we trust in God and his faithfulness. He is the God of covenants. He is the one who fulfills his promises. His word is secure. We can lean into it. When we get into the scripture, we can remind ourselves, no, this is the truth. Even though I feel like the world is falling apart, no, the truth is he is in control. He's sovereign. His word says that he will carry you. The Bible doesn't say, contrary to the false gospel out there, the Bible doesn't say you won't face trouble or trial. No, no, that's a false gospel. Go back with me to the beginning of, of James. I want to wrap out, up with this for today. Look at the first few verses that we looked at in James. What do we see there in his word? He actually promises us trouble. But he promises something through that trouble. There we read this. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. 
And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Here's the deal. God says you will encounter trials. You will encounter trouble in this life. But God is doing something with that for your good. See, when we respond by faith to those trials with joy, the joy knowing that he's in control, he is building endurance in us. And as he builds endurance in us, that is making us mature. He's accomplishing something. And that maturity is fullness, completeness in Jesus. God is about conforming you to the image of his son. He's about making you more like Jesus. And I want to be more like Jesus in my life. Amen? So God is up to something in the hard times. He's faithful, true to his promises, true to his covenant. He will carry you to the end. And that is the cure for anxiety. Leaning into him, trusting him. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for your kindness to us. That we can trust in what you're doing. Even in the hard times, even in the trials that we've been seeing in the book of James. And Lord, in that, you have blessings in mind for us. <coughs> you know what you're doing. We don't know what tomorrow brings, but you do. We were not made to know what tomorrow brings. We may plan, and planning is good, but we, Lord, right now confess you are God and we are not, and we endeavor to submit our plans to you and actually ask that our plans um, uh, deviate so that they're your plans. God, we won't find our help in the government. We won't find our help in our hard work. We won't find our help in our bank account. We won't find our help in drugs. We won't find our help in recreation. We will find our help in you. So may we lean and run towards you. In your name, amen.